Hi everyone, I want to talk a little bit about tightening our writing, making our writing more concise, yet making it clear and also making it comprehensive. So we will discard words that don't add anything to our conversation in order to make our wor words and our sentences more concise and in order to help our audience get meaning from what it is we write. Style considerations, we're in the United States, so everything we do will be fairly business casual. Our user guide or our formal report will not use contractions, but everything else can use contractions. Sentence patterns, we'll talk about varying sentence patterns, active and passive voice, we'll talk about being concise, we'll talk about being conversational, we'll talk about using second person, so don't use first person ever in this class, avoid third person, one does not use one as a pronoun in this class, because using one as a pronoun is too stilted. Use you, second person. Grammar, use standard English. So those of you putting periods and commas outside your closing quotation marks might be doing this incorrectly. So use the forums and asking class. Passive versus active. We want in this class to use the active voice as much as possible. Now, if you're in the sciences, biology, chemistry, your lab reports, they're all passive. If you're in the UK or Europe, things tend to be a little more, more passive. We use active voice because it's simpler, clearer, easier to understand, and frankly, easier to, easier to translate. You can use the passive to avoid blame. Use the passive sometimes just to stop your words from getting monotonous, and passive can make a, a transition easier. But passive is longer and more difficult to understand. Sometimes, for example, you do want to use the passive. Your order of soccer balls was shipped today and will arrive on November 4th. We don't care that Fred and shipping ship the soccer balls. We just care when they get here. Countrywide approved bad mortgages. This is a company that approved bad mortgages. We gave them the blame. That's Active Voice. However, these mortgages were written off as uncollectible in 2007. We don't say the government wrote them off, Countrywide wrote them off, whichever bank bought Countrywide wrote them off. We don't discuss that. Just know that they were written off, and that's the passive voice. The shipment of plants was damaged during shipment. Well, it's a little redundant, but the point is you like plants, you mail order the plants, the plants come, the plants are damaged. So did Fred, the UPS guy, damage the plants during shipment? Or are you going to let him off the hook and say the plants were damaged and use the passive voice? So Joe drove the car down the street. That's active voice, subject, verb. Joe did it. We know it. Passive voice, the car was driven down the street. That's passive. Even though the prepositional phrase by Joe is there, it's still passive. That prepositional phrase will give this away, use of the verb to be. In this case, was, will give away use of the passive. When in doubt, use the active voice. It's shorter, clearer, and easier to understand. We're going to keep things simple, use simple words. So avoid using Latin words like via. Uh, use the word by, for example. Avoid extra words. Words like simply or basically or words that we don't need. For example, to install Jing software, basically all you have to do is, well, no, don't use basically. Unless you're going to explain some advanced way to do this installation, you don't need the word basically. You do still want transitions in your sentences, but avoid filler words that add nothing. And basically and simply are two great examples. You'll also want to avoid words that, that are grand or speak to a, something that is obvious, such as technical writing is an important skill in the world today. That is obviously a filler sentence. We don't need to be talking about the world today. We probably haven't done the research to see how important technical writing is in the world today. So instead of writing that sentence, which is really going to add nothing to our content, throw it away and focus on what the audience really needs to know. For example, if you're talking about comparing an Apple laptop and a Dell laptop, you might begin, laptops are very common in the world today. No, throw that generalization, that broad generalization away. It doesn't add anything. People all over the world enjoy using laptops. Again, did you do a scientific study? Probably not. Avoid the broad generalizations. Do remember that business writing and technical communication is not a series of lists. Use paragraphs unless you have a reason for a list. For example, in technical communication, we're going to use a numbered list or an ordered list for instruction. And class convention is, that's going to be a complete sentence, an action followed by a result if there's a result. So just bear in mind that unless there's a reason for a list, don't just arbitrarily, arbitrarily use bullets.
So how do you do this? Remove the words that say nothing. We'll talk about more of those. Use gerunds, the ing form of verbs, and infinitives to shorten sentences. Combine sentences, we'll talk about that. And put the meaning of your sentence into your subject and verb. And keep Focus on keeping your subject and verb close together. Let's consider this. The Intel Core Duo processor runs at 1.8 gigahertz and uses transistors that are small enough to fit 50 times into a human cell. Well, if you're comparing two laptops and you want to help a customer or a coworker or the IT department pick laptops for the sales force, nobody probably cares, except for Intel marketing, that all these transistors will fit into a human cell. It's probably completely unimportant. So focus on what the customer really wants to know. They probably don't even care that the processor is 1.8 gigahertz. They probably care it's fast enough to run modern business software. So you've got all these computer specifications in your head that you can't relate to real-world application. The real-world application is this will run Microsoft Office very well. If you're comparing a MacBook and, and a Dell laptop, you might say, I recommend that you consider buying an Apple MacBook Pro. But then focus in on what the verb you mean is. What are you really trying to say? I recommend that you consider buying. You're really recommending that somebody buy. I recommend buying an Apple MacBook Pro. If you're writing this down for your IT department for their big laptop purchase, the purpose of this memo is to compare two laptops and provide a recommendation to you on which to buy. Again, too many words distill it. This memo evaluates two laptops and recommends you purchase the Apple MacBook Pro. In post-sales technical communication, in business writing, your audience wants to know the answer in the first paragraph, if not the first sentence. This is not a murder mystery. Don't make them get to the end of the memo before you say, we like the Dell, but the, but the Apple's the way to go. So when you are providing clear, concise documentation for your audience, give them the answers they want in the first paragraph, if not the first sentence. Vary your sentences. You want a few sentences that are short, under 10 words, but if they're all under 10 words, your writing sounds choppy. Most sentences, 10 to 20 words, and if you're using three commas or you don't stop for a breath for five minutes, your, your sentence is probably too long, so avoid them over 30 words. I am not counting your sentences. I am, however, aware that your sentences sound choppy or that I haven't paused for a break in five minutes. Use parallel structure, we'll talk about that too. So really quickly, just go over types of sentences. I won't hold you to the types of sentences. I will just hold you to varying your sentence types. So a simple sentence has one main clause. I received the soccer balls today. Yes, I'm expecting them in November, but apparently they came today. One main clause, simple sentence. Compound sentence, two main clauses with a conjunction. I received the soccer balls today, but they were the wrong size. Two main clauses and a conjunction. Maybe these are youth soccer balls, size three or four, and we want full size five soccer balls. Who knows? A complex sentence has one main clause and one subordinate clause. When the sports store opens, there's our subordinate clause. I will return the soccer balls. There's our main clause. Those are three kinds of sentences. Vary them in your writing. You can just pause on this. This is an example sentence length. You can read this. I'll probably post it. And you can shorten this and make it that short without throwing away important content, by the way. And then you can make it even shorter without throwing away important content. The point here is to be clear and concise and comprehensive, so don't throw away things that mean something. Keep your subjects closer together. For example, movements resulting from termination, layoffs, leaves, recalls, transfers in, transfers out, promotions, outside promotions from within are documented. Movements are your subject, are documented as your verb, separated by a whole bunch of words, makes the sentence confusing. You need to be more clear and more direct. The following movements are documented. There goes the subject and verb right next to each other. Makes the sentence very clear. Use parallel structure. That means use the same forms of, of words to make things clearer. So I interviewed juniors and seniors and athletes. But athletes, juniors, and seniors aren't the same thing. So this is unclear. Did you interview juniors and seniors and athletes and non-athletes? Did you interview some juniors who are athletes and some seniors who are not? Where are non-athletes in this? So you have to be parallel and so your audience can understand what it is you're saying. So I interviewed juniors and seniors. In each rank, I interviewed athletes and non-athletes. That makes it clear what it is you're talking about because you're using parallel structure. Errors can be found by reviewing the daily exception report or note the number of errors you see when matching the bill of lading with the invoice. The word note here is not parallel to the word reviewing. 
listen to how it sounds when note is parallel. Errors can be found by reviewing the daily exception report or noting the number of errors you see when matching the bill of lading with the invoice. So use your parallel verb structures when you're uh, creating a list like that so the list makes sense. I like to see headings using the same part of speech, such as gerunds, but you can certainly use nouns. I like to see lists beginning with the same parts of speech. So you might have a bulleted speech and each bullet item starts with an action verb, for example, in a resume, or you might have a set of instructions and each step of the instruction begins with an action verb because in, in this class, step has to be an instruction. And then your list has to be all sentences or all fragments. In this class, ordered lists or numbered lists or instruction steps have to be complete sentences. But your bulleted lists, such as a shopping list, milk, eggs, butter, cheese, that can be sentence fragments. But don't mix complete sentences and sentence fragments in the same list. Revising paragraphs, this goes back to basic grammar. Have topic sentences at the beginning of your paragraph for support and sentences to follow with detail. A topic sentence sort of gives you an idea of the structure and content of the paragraph. This is basic writing. The textbook has more information on this. But yes, please use traditional paragraphs. So you're typically going to have one topic in each paragraph. Focus on, and I've said this already, what you really mean when you're writing your content. What's the real verb you're focusing on? The purpose of this resume is to consider and possibly recommend. No, I recommend. Focus on what you really mean. Read what you write out loud. Have your roommate read it. The words you stumble over probably need fixing. And revise those sentences where readers stumble. Chapter 10 in your textbook, read it, know it, take notes on it. Avoid filler, basically and simply, I already said this. Avoid wordy phrases, a majority of. The word most would work there in order to, just the word to by itself. In order to download Jing, colon, to download Jing, colon. Avoid fancy words, advise, utilize. Use use in this class, don't use utilize. Use is a perfectly good word for you to use. Use lists as appropriately, not every paragraph is a list. Emphasize new and important information. Perhaps include that at the beginning of your sentence or paragraph. Choose an appropriate sentence length, focus on the real subject, the real verb. Parallel construction and use modifiers effectively. We'll talk a little bit more about modifiers. So, avoid misplaced and dangling modifiers. Here's some cute examples of these. The young girl was walking the dog in a short skirt. Obviously, the modifier short skirt applies to the young girl, not the dog. The dog was chasing the boy with a spike collar. I understand. Punk music is probably out now. A long time. I'm not sure how many spike collars there are left, uh, but chances are the dog has the spike collar. Students can only use MySCSU at SCSU, or only students can use MySCSU at SCSU. Which is it? Joe is allergic to raw carrots and apples. So is he allergic to raw carrots and raw apples? How does that work? Joe is allergic to apples and raw carrots. So just watch your modifiers and fix them. For example, dangling modifiers. Having been thrown in the air, the dog caught the stick. Chances are it wasn't the dog that was thrown in the air. Probably what you need to do here is add a subject for throwing the stick in the air. Or for example, the dog caught the stick that was thrown in the air. Or I threw the, the stick in the air and the dog caught it. Smashed flat by a passing truck, the dog sniffed at what was left of the half-eaten hamburger. It's a rather cruel sentence, but the point is, it's probably not the dog that is being smashed flat here. So, after the hamburger was smashed flat by a passing truck, the dog sniffed at it. For example, avoid modifiers that are unclear because they're misplaced or dangling. Focus on the real verb. Utilize a screwdriver, and utilize is one of those words that I want you to avoid. Utilize a screwdriver to back the screws out of the case. What's the real verb here? Unscrew is the real verb. Unscrew the screws from the case. Maintenance of your car's engine oil should be affected every 3,000 miles. Change your car's engine oil every 3,000 miles. Focus on the real verb. Focus on the real noun. It is hoped that this manual empowers the user to perform maintenance on the system. We hope this manual helps you maintain the system. And in fact, in this class, I don't want you using first person. So you'd have to re revise that even further. Be clear and specific. Use active and passive. Be aware of active and passive. Be specific. Avoid jargon. Jargon is industry terms. For example, an EMT might report that the patient is unable to ambulate. Well, ambulara is a great Latin word meaning to walk. 
The EMT could say, the patient can't walk. That's what I suggest everybody in this class say. But EMTs, doctors, and nurses use ambulate as jargon, meaning to walk, just because they're hanging on to that Latin word. Use positive constructions. Avoid negative as much as possible. Avoid long noun strings. Avoid cliches. Avoid euphemisms, such as a euphemism for, for putting a pet down would be the big sleep, for example. It's a cruel one, but it's a good example. Avoid euphemisms. There are lots of euphemisms for firing people, such as letting them go. Avoid euphemisms. You lose a lot of credibility by using them, and they're difficult to translate. In a similar vein, avoid idioms and metaphors. For example, keep your writing short and sweet. Short and sweet is difficult to translate if you think about it, because those aren't the words that apply. So avoid idioms and avoid metaphors and say what it is you really mean. Write concisely. Short and sweet might be perfectly applicable to a French pastry in a nice bakery, but it is not what you should apply to your writing, especially, especially if you're considering translation. Use precise words, provide adequate detail, an appropriate detail, and avoid ambiguity. Jargon can be all of these things. You use jargon if you're writing for an industry. If you're writing for the medical industry, use that word ambulate. It gets you credibility, but, if, but know your audience. So, don't use jargon that your audience would be unfamiliar with. Avoid obvious statements. Everybody in the world uses a laptop, for example. If you're using the words in the world and you haven't done the research, or you're using obvious statements or grand statements or unsupported statements. Avoid pompous words. One doesn't use one in this class because one is a pronoun is pompous. Sexist language. Make it plural. Don't use he, she, s slash he. Don't use any of that. Don't alternate them. All that tells your audience is you're awkward when it comes to gender. Make it plural. Translation. Write good technical communication. Use consistent sentence structure. Use consistent languages. Language. Don't call something 10 different names. Be repetitive in the way you approach the description, discussion, and instruction. Use pronouns carefully. Avoid idioms and metaphors, jokes, puns, that kind of thing. And your, and your text will be ready for translation. Some examples. To download Jing, you must go to your browser and type www.textmyth.com in the search bar. Once you're in the website, type Jing in the search textmyth.com bar. The first result is the one you should click. When the web page loads, you'll see a button on the top right. Click that. These are, so I take some student writing and I, I change it a little bit to make it more obvious. So this isn't directly what a student wrote. But the point is, they're trying to tell somebody how to download, how to get to this application called Jing that TechSmith writes. It's a screen capture software. Best way to write it is open www.techsmith.com forward slash Jing. That takes you to the exact, lo exact location where the download is. Notice it's a complete sentence. It ends in a period. If this is in an, a web document, such as a post or uh, a URL, you want to make this hyperlink so somebody can click it and go there. You never want to, in instructions, ask, us, ask your audience to search. They might do the search differently than you did and come up with different answers. You always, whenever possible, want to tell them exactly where to go to get what they need. Additionally, you want to be clear and concise. The words open www.techsmith.com forward slash Jing tell you everything the preceding six lines tell you. We can, of course, today assume that people know that this opens in a web browser on a computer. We don't have to tell them that they have to open a computer and turn on a computer and open Chrome or Internet Explorer, or Firefox or Opera or Safari. We can just write it this way. But know your audience. If you're writing this for 90-year-olds, you might have to be a little more explicit about where the techsmith.com forward slash Jing actually goes. Read the license agreement, then click Agree button on the bottom right corner of the page. What we have is we have a problem with a comma here. It's a comma splice because then is not a conjunction, so there needs to be a conjunction after that comma. Here's how it works. Read the license agreement, comma, and then click Agree. That is much more clear. What you would do in software documentation is support this with a picture that shows the page where the Agree button is. The only reason that you would need to tell that the Agree button is in the bottom right corner of the page is if it wasn't immediately obvious. In today's world, Jing is an invaluable asset for communicating across the internet. If you're introducing the product called Jing, you want to say what it does. Telling people that in today's world it's an invaluable asset for communication doesn't tell them what it does this. 
Does this record my voice? Is this like Skype? So avoid broad generalizations, avoid marketing hype, just say what Jing does. It creates screen captures and screen videos. You don't even need to say that you can share them because you can share any files you create. You put them on each USB stick, you upload them to Dropbox, you attach them to an email. So of course you can share these files. So just say what, what Jing does. And with all that in mind, and in conclusion, use more active than passive voice. Mix it up, you can use passive, just minimize your use of passive voice. Vary your sentence length. Don't provide a lot of really short sentences, but don't use sentences that are overly long. If you have three or four commas in your sentence, it is probably too long. Throw away words that mean nothing. I focus on simply and basically, but you can also consider broad global statements, such as in the world today. If you find yourself typing that or saying that, you are probably not adding any content that is useful for your audience. Put subjects and verbs close together and minimize the number of phrases between them. If you're putting a couple of commas in the middle of your sentence with a parenthetical phrase, consider moving that phrase to the beginning or the end of the sentence so it doesn't interrupt what you are trying to communicate. Focus on what you really mean. Focus on the subject and focus on the verb that you really want to use. These are ways that you can tighten your writing. And I will try to make us aware of this as we go on and as we create our work this semester.